Hi everyone, my name is Liz Edmondson. I'm the Director of Energy and Environmental Policy here at CSG. And thank you all so much for attending the webinar today. We've got Chaz Miller with us. We're going to talk about product stewardship laws. Um, these laws have a goal of reducing environmental safety and health impacts of consumer products. And the laws typically focus on end-of-life management of these products. Um, I'll give you a brief bio about Chaz. Um, Chaz started his career at EPA and has also worked at the Glass Packaging Institute. He's currently the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the National Association of Waste and Recycling. And he's also the past chairman of the Maryland Recycling Network and currently an ex officio member of the Northeast Recycling Council. Um, and then just for some logistical info today, um, Chaz will be starting shortly. He'll go through his entire presentation. But you will have options to ask questions should those arise, and I encourage you to ask those when you think of them. There's a little box um, or a tab in your sidebar there that says questions, and you can just type your question directly into the box. We'll collect all the questions, and we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end um, for Chaz to answer some of your questions. Um, the webinar will also be recorded. It will be available in the next few days in CSG's Knowledge Center, and all of the attendees will receive an e-blast as to when that's available. Um, it'll be a YouTube video, so you can go back and actually watch the whole presentation with the audio and the uh, video, which it would be the slide deck. Um, and then you'd be able to send that link to somebody else or watch it again um, if, anybody, if you know of anybody interested in watching it or you just want to review it in the future. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Chad. So are we ready to start? I'm going to be discussing an overview of, of emerging issues and trend in product stewardship laws in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'm going to cover essentially is what is product stewardship, what are its goals, and how does it work? So let's start with what is product stewardship. Next slide, please. This is sort of a, a standard basic definition of product stewardship, that it's a policy in which the producer's responsibility extends to the post-consumer management of that product and its packaging. Now, definitions vary, but this one, this one I think is pretty typical and it's pretty basic. You can find much longer, more involved definitions. Uh, and one thing I want to point out is that the term product stewardship and the term extended producer responsibility, often simply called by its acronym EPR, are often used interchangeably. Now, they really have some slightly different meanings with product stewardship being more the overall approach and EPR simply being one of the tools. Uh, I will be using the term somewhat interchangeably in this presentation. But I will be focusing primarily on EPR and on the legislative side. So uh, next slide, please. What are the goals of, of these laws? Well, again, you go through the literature. Uh, you sort of basically there's three basic goals of EPR product stewardship laws. There's green design, uh, making products less toxic, more easily recyclable. There's internalizing cost. And there's a lower tax burden on local governments in the management of solid waste and in particular recyclables. Uh, next slide, please. So how do companies meet these goals? Well, you can do it through individual or collective responsibility. In individual responsibility, a company directly recovers and recycles its products. In collective responsibility, individual companies of a, different, of a particular product band together and create a product stewardship organization to collectively manage recovery and recycling on their behalf. Now, under the individual responsibility approach, you definitely have opportunity for green design and true cost internalization as each company focuses exclusively on their own product. However, you also tend to have very high transaction costs in that approach. 
As a result, collective responsibility is the common approach because collective responsibility achieves very significant economies of scale in operating these programs. However, under the collective responsibility model, green design and cost internalization are pretty much lost as individual companies split the cost of the overall program. And they usually split that on market share, which really takes away an incentive to, to do that green design or that true cost internalization. Next slide, please. So how widespread are EPR laws? Well, in Europe, they're fairly commonplace, in particular for packaging and uh, printed paper and for electronics, uh, many electronics projects, which are, uh, are, are, are the law throughout the uh, European Union uh, and all the countries that belong to the European Union. Uh, you also have laws covering cars. And you have some laws in some countries covering individual products. For instance, Sweden has had a law on pharmaceutical recovery for about 40 years now. In Canada, EPR laws are widespread among the provinces. There's a great variety in what's covered in each province and exactly how the, how the, the programs operate in, those, in each province. Uh, the province of British Columbia is the leader uh, in Canada with approved plans for 22 categories of products. That's 22 categories of products covered in British Columbia. Uh, you also find these laws in Latin America, in Asia, and in Australia. But what about the United States? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this chart shows the extent of EPR laws in the United States. The states in violet have one law. The states in blue have two. Green have three. Yellow is four. Orange is five. Red is seven. And black is eight. Uh, that's 33 states with about 80% of the population with EPR laws. However, it's worth noting that almost half those laws are either in the six New England states and California. So in a sense, you have the laws heavily concentrated in two parts of the country, New England and California, and either non-existent or lightly spread throughout the rest of the country. Next slide, please. These laws cover a variety of products, uh, with electronics being by far the most common, uh, 25 laws, uh, 15 covering mercury aluminum switches, 14 mercury thermostats, uh, 3 covering fluorescent lamps, 10 covering batteries, uh, and then 8 with pl uh, paint, 3 mattresses, 1 carpet, and 4 others. And one of the others is a framework law that empowers the state to pick materials for EPR laws. Uh, it's worth noting of the 83 laws, 80% 80 of them cover products with toxic constituents, primarily mercury. And uh, that's clearly been the trend in this country to focus on toxic or hard to recycle materials for EPR laws. Uh, next slide, please. We're also seeing uh, local jurisdictions adopting EPR ordinances. Uh, King County, Washington, and Alameda County and other counties in California passed ordinances requiring pharmaceutical collection programs. Uh, the Alameda County ordinance was upheld by the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals uh, that covers California and some adjacent states. The Supreme Court declined to take the case when it was appealed to the Supreme Court. Uh, in the Circuit Court of Appeal decision, uh, the court said the Commerce Clause uh, was not uh, did not apply in that case. There was no restriction on interstate commerce. The court was also somewhat dismissive of the cost of the pharmaceutical program. Now, does that mean that's a final ruling by the Supreme Court on this subject? The answer is no. The Supreme Court, if another circuit court were to rule with an opposite opinion, if another circuit court were to rule against an EPR program, say a pharmaceutical program in a different circuit, then the Supreme Court would be much more likely to take the, the case in order to, to unify the law among the jurisdictions. It's also worth noting that at least one California town has a Sharps ordinance. Uh, next slide, please. So how effective are these laws? Well, disappointing results is the conclusion of Jennifer Nash of the Harvard Kennedy School and Christopher Basso of Northeastern University. And a, study titled Extended Producer Responsibility in the United States, Full Speed Ahead, which was uh, published in May 2013. They found low rates for electronics, about 15 to 20% recovery, about 10 to 12% for rechargeable batteries, 
less than 25% for mercury automobile switches, less than 10% for mercury thermostats. And they, they were very specific that the data applied whether or not these programs were mandatory as a result of EPR laws or voluntary industry-run programs. So next slide, please. Why did they say disappointing? Well, the first three came were, were cited by, by uh, Nash and Basso, inconsistent laws among the states, lack of accountability mechanisms in many states, failure of states to provide strong oversight. And I would add two other things that, that I, I think are very important when looking at these laws. One is that most of the products covered by EPR laws, but not all, but most are physically small products, and virtually all these products are only occasionally generated. In other words, unlike paper cans and bottles that we generate in our homes and our offices and, and that we kind of routinely recycle, especially in our homes, uh, there's no recycling norms for these very occasionally recycled products. And, and it's that recycling behavior that does not exist as opposed to the commonly recycled materials. There's also, as we're discovering on the electronic side, the difficulty of imposing a fixed law on a very dynamic industry. Uh, next slide, please. So let's look at, the, at the, uh, some specific examples of materials subject to EPR laws for a number of years, starting with batteries, which are a classic example of something that's physically small. Uh, very, easy, very easy to forget about recycling because, you know, we, rege we generate them so, so occasionally. So, uh, Call to Recycle is the product stewardship organization for uh, batteries and cell phones. They've been in operation for 19 years. They just announced a 5% increase in recovery uh, in 2015 over 2014, 12.6 million pounds of batteries. Uh, Call to Recycle and, uh, has published a number of excellent articles in the Resource Recycling Magazine. Uh, about what works and what does not work for battery recycling. Uh, one of the points that I think is particularly interesting is that voluntary collection points are more productive than mandatory collection points. In other words, if you get the buy-in of the retail establishment and they want to do the program, they're, they're apt to work at it a lot harder than somebody who's simply told you have to participate. They've also noted the challenge of establishing a recycling norm where one does not exist. But uh, very interesting progress as they move forward. Next slide, please. Mercury thermos, uh, automobile switches and thermostats. Mercury automobile switches are the lights in the trunk of a car, the little light that goes on when you open the trunk. Uh, they're banned from disposal federally. They haven't been uh, used in the cars in this country since 2003. So the, the, the number of mercury automobile switches out there has been slowly diminishing over the last uh, uh, do the math, Chess. 13 years. Uh, they're generated primarily at automobile dismantling operations, in fact, pretty much exclusively at automobile dismantling operations. It's interesting that the, the strongest two states for recovery of automobile switches, one has EPR, one does not. But what they both do is they educate and they enforce the disposal ban very aggressively with those automobile dismantlers. Uh, end of Life Vehicle Solutions is the product stewardship organization for that product. Mercury thermostats, uh, which are no longer made in the United States, uh, it's all digital now, what's made in this country. Uh, fairly limited generation again. Uh, the generators are primarily uh, HVAC companies, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning companies. And the key for them is simply getting access to the program when they're switching out a thermostat from from uh, from mercury to digital, having the ability to have access to a program. And the Thermostat Recycling Corporation is the product stewardship organization for mercury thermostats. Uh, next slide, please. Let's look at electronics, the product most commonly covered by product stewardship laws. Uh, tremendous disparity in state laws is the best way to describe electronics. So the, the, the term that's, that's commonly used is the patchwork quilt of laws. We have 25 laws, all 25 cover laptops and monitors. Uh, yet beneath that you have 10 different sets of what are called covered devices. All 25 apply to household recovery but they vary widely on businesses, governments, etc. And there's absolutely no consistency in financing or collection. And for a good breakdown of which devices are covered in which states. The Electronics Recycling Coordinating Clearinghouse 
and I hope I got the name right, uh, on their website they have that information. Uh, the range in recovery varies from Vermont with 7.79 pounds per person per year to Missouri with 0 0.37 pounds uh, per person per year. That, of course, is an extraordinary range. And while it's a little tricky to compare states state to state because of the wide variety in the law, when you see a great disparity between those two, you know obviously there's, there's a number of factors involved of which the law is really part of. It. Uh, next slide, please. Electronic laws are battling a host of problems, including weekend markets, outdated laws, CRT glass, and collection programs that are ending or adding fees. Uh, <clears throat> markets for the constituent elements in electronics products have declined in the last year whether it's steel, copper, or aluminum, or plastic, uh, those market declines have been substantial and very negative. Uh, precious metals that are used within electronics continue be, to be displaced by less expensive raw materials, lessening the value of the end product. Laws have not evolved as these products have evolved. Electronic products are lighter, more powerful, and more sophisticated than most of these laws were passed. For instance, uh, the smart tablet was invented in 2007, or it hit the market in 2007. At that time, only four states had laws covering electronics recycling, and five states passed laws that year. And I suspect none of those states had given any thought whatsoever to the impact of the smart tablet. The smartphone was introduced in 2010, and at that point, 20 states already had laws, and four more added their laws in 2010, and they again, I suspect none of those laws gave any thought whatsoever to the impact of the smartphone. Uh, one of the problems we're seeing and dealing with is states with goals based on weight recovery. When, they meet, when manufacturers meet those weight recovery goals, they tend to start buying back the, uh, the product. Uh, that creates problems. There was an article in research uh, in the eScrap News recently about Rhode Island noting uh, this uh, situation occurring in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, Illinois, the state of Illinois, the Illinois IEPA, uh, recently released a review of the e-waste program in Illinois. Uh, this is one of the, the problems that they noted in that report. And among their recommendations, the primary one they made at this point uh, was simply better access to getting these products back into the program. CRT glass has become a, or CRTs themselves have become a major problem for electronics recycling. CRT is a high volume tube in which cathode rays produce a luminous image on a fluorescent screen. They're used almost exclusively in televisions and computer terminals. Uh, according to the National Center for Electronics Recovery, 70 to 75 percent of what is collected is by, by weight is CRTs. And that's a, a, a data from them in April of 2014, although I don't think the weight has gone down much in the, in the last two years. And what you have in a CRT is a mixture of glass, lead, metals, and plastic, with glass and lead the biggest components by weight. And because of markets and because of, of declining end users for CRTs, CRT simply has a negative recycling value. Now, what has this led to is that a number of programs are ending or uh, simply stopping to collect electronics products, or they're adding fees to cover the collection of processing costs. Some of you may have seen the news item that just came out about a major retailer uh, stopping its, 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 if you will, free collection and now charging, I believe it was $25 to bring back electronics for recovery in their program. I think, quite frankly, that the, the problems of electronics recovery would make for a great webinar all of its own for CSG to do uh, somewhere down the road. Uh, but next slide, please. What about the newer additions to these laws? Paint, carpets, and mattresses. Uh, paint in eight states, mattresses with laws in three states, carpets in one state. What's interesting about these three hard to recycle products is they all have a transparent recycling fee. Uh, for paint, it's roughly it's 75 cents a gallon. For mattress, it's $11 a mattress. For uh, carpet, it's currently 20 cents per square yard, which means that when a consumer buys a that product in, in, in one of the states with those laws, they know they are paying for the recycling. They get a very clear price signal that recycling is not free and that cost is now part of the product that they have bought. Next slide, please. 
so how are these products, how are these programs working out? Paint Care is the product stewardship organization for paint recovery. Its state reports show that it's building a strong recycling infrastructure with positive returns. Uh, for instance, in Oregon, 97.2% of Oregon residents live within 15 miles of a collection center. Uh, they collected 621,000 gallons of post-consumer paint in 2015. That's an 83% recovery rate based on the estimate of the amount of paint that's left to the can. About 70% of that is latex. It's simply a water-based paint. It's not a hazardous product. 30% is alkyd. It's an oil-based paint. It's definitely a, a hazardous material. Uh, and they're able to recycle two-thirds uh, of what they collect uh, among their latex paint and is similarly high among their oil base. And I think one advantage that paint has it, well, actually is, is simply that we, when we buy paint, we use it immediately. I, very few people go out to the store and buy a can of paint just to have one in the house. They buy that can of paint because they've got a, a painting project in their house they want to do. You see that transparent fee when you buy the paint. It's in your mind that you paid to recycle it, so it might be smart to return it to the store for recycling. I think that helps create the recycling ethic for paint. I think it helps create it very positively. Mattress and carpet are a little bit different. Uh, Mattress Recycling Council is the group for mattresses. Carpet America Recovery Effort is the group for uh, carpets. We have very little data uh, on carpet and mattress recovery quite simply because the programs are so new. Uh, mattress is just getting started. Carpet's been around in California for two or three years. Uh, they are large, bulky items that are only occasionally generated. Um, and I think that creates the problem because there is no recycling ethic for these very occasionally created products. And that's what both the Mattress Recycling Council and CARE are trying to do, is working to create that recycling ethic. Uh, next slide, please. So what works for EPR? And again, this comes from the Nash Basso study. Uh, and, and this is taken directly from their study because I, it pretty much speaks for itself. They talk about high expectations need to be set for these programs. Uh, actors need to work in concert, work together to achieve them. Uh, the state agencies that are responsible for program oversight uh, must be able to get rigor and accountability uh, when they review the programs, when they review process, uh, progress, and potentially uh, pursue penalties as appropriate. Next slide, please. So I'd like to take those ideas and look specifically at what works for different uh, products. Let's start with electronics, you know, where the highest per person recovery rate is in states that have very specific recovery goals, specific access convenient goals, and specific program awareness goals. And think about that for a second. Uh, you got a target to be set, and of course you want to set the right one. Uh, you, you need to have access and convenience, uh, and you want people to know about it. Well, let's look at automobile switches. Very different product, and, and there what you have is a system of material that's banned from disposal. The generators are pretty much limited to one group. So really, you work with that group, uh, to educate and to enforce. With thermostats, uh, you have access to programs primarily through HVAC pro uh, companies, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning companies, which are by far the biggest generator of thermostats. And it's interesting with thermostats that by far the most successful mercury thermostat recovery program in this country over the last decade is in a state that does not have an EPR law. It's the state of Maryland, where several years ago, the Public Utilities Commission decided to encourage, as a part of energy conservation and energy efficiency, the switch over from mercury thermostats to digital thermostats. So they created an incentive for the various utilities in the state to switch that out, which created uh, a great opportunity to collect the mercury thermostats, because now you had this program going on and the Thermostat Recycling Corporation could work with the various uh, utilities and all their HVAC contractors so that when they switched out a mercury thermostat, they could collect it for recycling. Uh, not EPR, just simply very creative energy conservation program with a very nice uh, side effect. Certainly for paint, the access and the visible fee. 
A recent report that came out uh, analyzing the Oregon program noted that 88% of retailers said customers knew the fee was to pay for recycling, and the customers were generally supportive of recycling and paying the fee. Uh, with batteries, clearly access is a, a, um, a key component of success in, in developing that recycling ethic. Next slide, please. So let's look at whether product stewardship laws have met their goals. Starting with, does EPR lead to green design, to less toxic materials, and more easily recycled uh, materials? Looking at Europe in particular, but also at America, Europe on cars and electronics, and America on electronics, there is some evidence of design improvements to facilitate recycling. It has to do uh, with material unification, standardization of types and grades of plastic, relatively minor changes, but there's some evidence of those changes. There's absolutely no evidence in Europe of green design for packaging or for printed paper. And the same kind of things that we've seen in, in green design for packaging, or if you will, lightweighting, uh, making less packaging, uh, using less resources, you can find equally in America. It's just it's common uh, evolution of packaging. Uh, we know that in terms of toxics, there are alternatives, bans help. Uh, banning mercury in automobile switches, functionally banning mercury in thermostats, the ROSE program in Europe, and toxics and packaging legislation in the United States have led to toxics reduction because they place limits on use. Uh, toxics and packaging legislation is in 19 states in this country, uh, covers 53% of the U.S. population, and functionally it's national legislation. And it bans the intentional introduction of lead, mercury, cadmium, and hexavalent chromium uh, from packages. It's, it's a smashing success. And there's a way to reduce toxicity uh, quickly and easily. Uh, next slide, please. What about cost internalization? Well, we haven't seen any, any evidence yet. And quite frankly, pass-through cost is inevitable. Uh, manufacturers are going to pass the cost on to the consumer. The question is whether the consumer knows about it or not. And there's evidence now, clearly on the electronic side, that any additional cost caused by an EPR program simply becomes a cost of doing business. And I've noticed this before, is that the paint, carpet, and mattress companies believe the shown cost of recycling sends a signal uh, to the buyer that recycling is not free and that they have a stake uh, in successful recycling. Next slide, please. Uh, the question of the lower tax burden, uh, there's some interesting, there's a study that just came out on EPR low programs lowering the cost to local governments of managing uh, difficult to recycle products that had to do with paint recycling. Uh, and it looked, I believe, primarily at California, but it may have looked at, at other states. Um, and, and that as a result of the paint recovery, the household hazardous waste programs uh, had more money available uh, for what they were doing, which made them much more efficient in how they could operate for other uh, hazardous products. Now, this raises an interesting question. Uh, do taxpayers get a rebate from the local government for these cost savings? Uh, and I suspect the answer is no, which really means the consumers now pay twice. They're still going to be paying taxes that are going to be covering the cost of those HHW programs, but at the same time, they're paying the cost as consumers. And this sort of a question, is that, is that an efficient economic or environmental practice? Uh, next slide, please. Let's look at expansion for uh, sharps and for uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, I mentioned earlier the, the, the pharmaceuticals in King County and in Alameda County. Uh, the programs are not implemented yet, so we have no data on their success. In the Canadian uh, province of Ontario, recently released its report on the success of its on the on the its pharmaceutical and um, uh, Sharps uh, EPR take back programs. Uh, in in that province for pharmaceuticals, the goal is collection site, and they went from a, a pretty much of a voluntary program where 30 percent of the retail outlets participated to now 90% of the retail outlets in the province participate in the program. So they've clearly ex expanded their uh, recovery. Uh, they can't give you an actual recovery rate. They can give you a recovery tonnage, but they can't tell you if that's 5% or 10% or 
or 50% of the available pharmaceuticals. And uh, they also have a Sharps program in Ontario. They also have one in Prince Edward's Island, which just started. Uh, the one in Ontario is about two years old. Uh, the most recent data show that it collected, and, and I believe it was around 300 long tons, Canadian tons, of Sharps. And that's not just Sharps the needles. That also includes the weight of the collection container and, and the various peripherals will often go with Sharps. Now, both these programs sort of show the extraordinary problem of changing individual behavior and for, where, where there's no existing recycling ethic. We know in the case of sharps of 300 tons, and that's absolutely great. That's 300 tons of sharps that are no longer uh, uh, potentially out there to cause harm. But is it 1%? Is it 50%? That we don't know. And I think for sharps to be successful, and there will be sharps legislation in this country, I, I, I'm certain, uh, it's probably going to require a transparent recycling fee so that the individual user of what is, let's face it, a dangerous object, a sharp, a needle, uh, knows that they have now paid for a recycling container and that they should take that back to where, to uh, the point of the retail point for collection. Uh, that's going to be a big change. But sharps are a unique product. They are dangerous in and of themselves, and if they're carelessly disposed, they pose dangers to, to sanitation workers, to recyclers, people in recycling facilities, uh, and, you know, there, there's clearly a lot of the users are not well educated to have the proper disposition of those sharps. So I think that recycling fee will send a very signal, a very clear, transparent signal about what is involved. Uh, next slide, please. We've also seen interest in expansion of packaging in printed paper, which is the product Policy Institute, now known as Upstream, uh, once said was, was uh, simple in concept and complex in execution. And I think that's a very fair description. And actually, a very similar description could be found in the old Resource Conservation Committee report way back in 1980 about a, a much earlier and, if you will, much more primitive form of, of product stewardship, that it was very complicated. And what both comments really acknowledge is that in the United States, we have a very complex system of managing waste and recyclables. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act is part of the reason for that. Solid waste and recycling are state and local issues. And we have 50 states along with D.C. and the six territories. We have almost 3,100 counties. And we have 1,900 incorporated cities, towns, villages, and, and, and so forth. There's a lot of variety in how we manage our solid waste in this country because of this complexity. And, so, and that's going to create tremendous challenges for an EPR law for packaging and paper. Let's look at some of those challenges. Next slide, please. Well, the first of all, we often hear the high recycling rates in Europe cited is, is why we should do this in America for packaging and printed paper. But as a former Secretary of State once pointed out, the United States is not Europe. And we have to understand the differences between the United States and Europe. Uh, very significant difference in terms of housing size, uh, population density, geography, demographics, uh, cultural differences, that you simply cannot transform programs from Europe to this country or vice versa necessarily from this country to European countries and just assume they will automatically work as well as they did in their originating country. Uh, recycling programs simply are not tax dependent in the United States. Uh, starting off with virtually all commercial and multifamily costs are paid as contract fees from the owner of the facility uh, to the business that's collecting their, their solid waste and their recyclables. When it comes to residential recycling programs, uh, taxpayers, taxes are only used to pay for recycling in about 30% of jurisdictions in this country. The rest either use an enterprise fund or its contracts in which the hauler or the city simply collects a contract fee uh, from the residents. And the enterprise fund is a particularly important uh, aspect here. They were promoted heavily by EPA in the late 70s as a way of getting solid waste off the tax base. So solid waste activities and recycling activities would be independently funded uh, with a fund that's set up to be used strictly for those purposes. Um, and as you can see, it's been 
somewhat widely adopted in the United States with taxpayers uh, having a much smaller percentage. Uh, <clears throat> so it's clear that only where taxes are used would, would local governments uh, even get relief, if you will. The next two comments, existing uh, contractual and franchise arrangement, arrangements and antitrust are narrower, but they're very equally important issues uh, because of the complexity of the way we, we do our recycling services in this country, the length of years or for many of those contracts, uh, the exclusive nature of many of those franchises. Uh, those are practical barriers that have to be dealt with. And they will be very significant in some areas. And then, of course, there's the whole antitrust issue of giving power to a um, product stewardship organization and making sure it does not violate antitrust laws. The final, I think, is often overlooked, but it's actually very, very crucial, not just to product stewardship, but to recycling as a whole. Recycling is about behavior change. A funding mechanism, which is what product stewardship is, can help promote and educate in behavior on better behavior, but it does not guarantee behavior change. There's sort of a belief that we have silver bullets and that we have a magic solution for recycling, we have a magic solution for waste disposal. Silver bullets do not exist to solve the issues affecting recycling or waste disposal for that matter. We have a lot of different tools to manage, but we don't have any silver bullets and it's important to keep that in mind. And finally, next slide, please. In conclusion, uh, we have 33 states that have these laws. Uh, it clearly is a funding mechanism for collection and recycling of a variety of materials. Electronics are the most common product subject to, uh, to these laws. Uh, the electronics problem uh, programs are having problems right now, uh, problems that need to be fixed uh, so that they can continue to move forward. And we're starting to see this at the state level, more interest in, in passing laws to, to bring those programs up to date um, without at the same time, I hope, simply recreating the problem of static laws for a dynamic product. Uh, paint recovery appears to be the most successful, although eight states is still a pretty small uh, database of states to draw a conclusion from. Uh, I think it's fair to say that a one-size-fits-all approach will not work for different products. Uh, different, different products require different needs for recycling. Uh, and, and a comment that probably echoes a lot through this presentation, uh, behavior change is absolutely crucial. Uh, it's behavior change that makes recycling work, creating that social norm of recycling creating that social norm so that every day on recycling day you drive down the street in your neighborhood and you see the blue bins out so that you people see people doing it commonly in commercial buildings, even in, in, in the public. It's that behavior change that matters. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to conclude. If you want to put the next slide on, uh, this is, uh, you have questions for me, more information, contact, and then I have on the additional slides, they have all the different sources uh, that I used for the presentation along with links to those sources. Uh, be very happy for people to, uh, you know, go get them, read them, uh, use them. Uh, so if you got any questions, uh, feel free. Let's go. Let's have some questions. Okay. Um, if you haven't submitted a question yet and you have one, I would, I would encourage you to do so. Um, so here's one. States such as South Carolina, Michigan, Virginia, New Mexico, Georgia, Indiana, Louisiana have poor product stewardship regulations and waste disposals. Most are worst governments in the American state litter scorecard. Um, I'm not sure if that was actually a question or just a comment, but um, is there, um, Chaz, do you see a relationship? Um, oh, I'm sorry. We Okay, let me do that again. Okay. No, that was it. Sorry. So let me, let me read again. Um, okay. So this, uh, so this commenter says, 
Um, the states I mentioned have poor product stewardship regulations and waste disposals, and um, most are worse governments in the American state litter scorecard. And I'm not sure if that was a comment or a question, but I don't know if you, if you have any comments on that or why that is. Uh, no, I'd, I'd have to see the scorecard. I've seen it in the past, and it's, it's an interesting document. A lot of work has gone into it. But I have to admit, I, I, I just I, I really can't comment it without looking back at it. OK, so the, the, the person asked any questions said that it was just a comment, so just for everybody okay. listening. Um, OK, perfect. So I started reading it before I read the whole thing. <laughs> um, OK, um, what are done with mattresses collected via the EPR program? Uh, well, the best people to ask that of that would be the Mattress Recovery Council. You, you, you take it to mattress recycling facilities where they will uh, disassemble the parts. Uh, they will uh, and then segregate by the recyclable items. For instance, the, the, if it's got uh, steel coils in the mattress, uh, the various components in the mattress, the wood, what have you, and those will go to end products in markets. Uh, my understanding is not all the components of a mattress can be recycled, and those will have to be disposed of. Okay, great. Um, do you know of current efforts in state legislators across the country to implement good product stewardship laws? I, and so, do I know of good efforts? Um, right. Thirty-three laws were introduced in twi or thirty-three bills were introduced for product stewardship legislation in 2015. Uh, three of them passed both houses. One was signed into law, but it was one that actually slightly narrowed the the main law in application. Uh, in the state of New Jersey, paint and electronics reform law, a paint law passed and electronics reform law passed. Both were pocket vetoed by Governor Christie, uh, which a you know, pocket veto means that no reason needs to be given for the veto. Um, my guess is that the proponents of those bills will be reintroducing them in those states. And um, beyond that, uh, it, it, you know, 2015 was not a, did not see new laws. Okay, um, and just. Kind of a follow-up to that question, you said that 33 bills were introduced in 2015. Um, are those bills proposing any new products to be covered that aren't already covered under existing laws or proposing to do anything novel or different um, than some of the laws that are already in place? I believe one of the bills did cover sharps and pharmaceuticals in California. Um, beyond that, it was uh, batteries and uh, uh, paint and uh, just the other prime mattresses, the products that I already talked about, fluorescent lights. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Um, has anyone done oil filter recycling bills at all? You know, it's it, it's quite possible that an oil filter recycling bill was introduced in the last couple of years. Um, I, I don't read every single piece of recycling legislation that's introduced. I think there have been some, but I, in all honesty, I can't remember when and where. Okay, and then for the person who asked that question, I can probably do some research and get that information okay. for you. Um, do you see synergy between EPR and green product design standards, such as the cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach? Uh, I think actually the, the green product design standards are going to have a longer-term impact uh, as, as they develop because they are much more specific in application. They're much more specific in what they're going at. Um, and I think they give very specific, very clear and immediate signals to designers the best way to design green. 
and and they're generally the use of a co the the result of a collaborative process, or certainly of, of a lot of people sharing ideas. Great. Um, do you see Sharp's pharmaceutical pharmaceutical take back regulations continuing to be launched at the county level, and are there any indication of consolidation, at least at the state level, in the future? Uh, clearly in California, I think you're going to see more pharmaceutical at the county level and maybe Sharps. Um, and then there's the, the one in King County, which is in the state of Washington. I haven't heard of any similar local uh, movements in other states. Uh, whether or not they lead to state law has yet to be seen. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it's yeah, we don't have any of these laws in any of the jurisdictions yet. We have no idea how effective they're going to be. We have no idea. You know, they're going to be primarily based on, uh, I would presume, certainly on the pharmaceutical side, on collection uh, access percentages. And the question is going to be, what you know, once you get that collection access, will there be enough education? And will they will, will they make a true impact on on uh, collecting pharmaceuticals. Um, and you know, you can get in an interesting discussion with pharmaceuticals. Uh, clearly, the problem of flushing pharmaceuticals down a toilet and, and whether or not that's uh, not a particularly wise strategy, obviously. Uh, is it a problem putting pharmaceuticals in the trash? What is the evidence that pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals have caused any environmental problems in a landfill? Um, I happen to live in a county in Maryland that has a waste energy facility. I put my unused pharmaceuticals in the trash to go to that facility. It's the same facility used by uh, the federal government to incinerate uh, pharmaceuticals. So, you know, you get into some issues like that that I think make the pharmaceutical debate much more interesting because of the ins and outs and where you get the, the, the most positive impact on protecting the environment. And I, I think I already pretty much said about Sharps, uh, you clearly need sharps to be out of the waste stream. They are a hazard to uh, solid waste workers. They're a hazard to people in recycling facilities. And they're a hazard to people when they, you know, we even know of incidents of sharps washing up on, on, on shores. But again, the tool devised has to be effective at collecting those sharps. It has to be effective at recovering those. And I, I think that education and that that transparent recycling fee are absolutely crucial to that. Okay, and then um, for the person that asked about how mattresses are recycled, um, we had a couple people at the Mattress Recycling Council um, on the webinar today, and what they have told us is that the products are broken down into four major components, steel, fiber fabric, foam, and wood, and mattress recyclers deconstruct these products and send these components for various reasons. Great. And Great. for more information about that, the website is um, the mattressrecyclingcouncil.org. And, and my thanks to them for, uh, for passing that <laughs> on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, we have a couple more questions. We have um, a few more minutes here. So um, let's see. Uh, is there a good example of a product stewardship law that displays the flexibility necessary for a dynamic industry? I don't know of any. Okay. I'm assuming you would have mentioned one of those if you did. <laughs> um, all right. What do you recommend for handling electronic products that will address the poor markets and will be scalable for new products in the future? Uh, in all honesty, if I knew the answer to that question, I'd already be trying to get the bill introduced. I, I, I don't know. I, I think part of the problem is you, you're dealing with a variety of issues right now. It, it's it's the, the collapse of the, the, the downturn in recycling markets. Collapse really in the right word, but the, the extraordinary downturn in recycling markets, uh, plastic, steel, etc. Um, you're dealing with the light weighting of, of plastic products. Uh, you're dealing with the problem of CRTs. I think it's going to it's going to take some of the best minds involved in in, uh, in 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 this area to get together and sit around the table and and see if we can figure out what the answer is. Uh, 
I think through the through ERCC and and, and through the National Electronics Recycling uh, Clearinghouse, you have uh, two very capable groups uh, who may be able to, and I may be getting into a lot of trouble for suggesting this, but may be able to to do some work in that area. Uh, but clearly, we've got a problem with the programs. Okay, we've just got a couple more here. Um, when EPR when EPR laws require, excuse me, let me start over. <laughs> when EPR laws require manufacturers to take back and recycle their products, do new markets result that may not have been available to local programs? Uh, probably. I, I I don't see why they wouldn't. Uh, I think you're going to see new mar markets for mattresses. Uh, probably already see new markets for mattresses in California. Uh, probably the same for carpets. Um, so you know you're, create, you're creating a supply. The issue for those new markets will be the ability of that supply to meet their needs as a viable industry. And that has yet to be determined. Uh, you know, see how well the programs work. OK, great. Um, and, and, and actually, I'd add one thing to that. That that really uh, would apply primarily to products for which there are much more limited markets. Uh, you, you know, you got other products where there's always a lot, are already a lot of markets out there. But that, that's all I'd add. Okay. Well, Chaz, I just want to thank you so much for your time today, um, and thank you for being with us. Thank you to everyone who attended the webinar as well. Just to remind everybody. Um, the webinar will be posted um, in the CSG Knowledge Center, which is a little hard to find on our website. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of the home page, there's a link to the Knowledge Center there. And then also in the menu bar, you can click the eAcademy link. Um, everybody who attended today will also receive an email, and that will have a link to um, Chaz's entire presentation. So it'll essentially be a YouTube video where you can watch the slide deck and, and hear Chaz's commentary throughout. Um, and that should be up within a couple of days, but like I said, you'll receive the e-blast to, to let you know that. Um, and my email is ledmondson at csg.org. If anyone has any questions, comments about the webinar, you can send those to me as well. Um, thanks so much. <laughs>